Hello and welcome to another tutorial video. This time around, as you can see, we're gonna be covering net operating losses in a discounted cash flow analysis. And the key phrase here is don't think too hard. This is a topic that a lot of people tend to overcomplicate and there are actually very simple ways of treating these items. Here's the typical question we get on this topic. How do you factor in net operating losses when building a DCF analysis? Do you have to create a separate schedule that shows the book versus cash taxes and how the NOLs reduce the company's taxes over time? I'm gonna give you a short answer and then go into a longer explanation of this. But the short answer for now is that it's probably not a great idea to do this. It's much easier to add the NOLs as a non-core business asset in the implied enterprise value to implied equity value calculation at the end. Remember that in a DCF, you can reflect income and expenses in two different ways. You can either reflect them within the free cash flow itself, or you can include the corresponding assets and liabilities at the end when moving from implied enterprise value to implied equity value. So if you include something in free cash flow, you should not include the corresponding assets and liabilities at the end. And if you exclude something, you do include the corresponding assets and liabilities at the end. So with net operating losses, for example, yes, one approach would be to go in and create some type of schedule and look at the amount the company actually pays in cash taxes and then modify net operating profit after taxes to reflect that number. But a much simpler approach is to simply take the net operating losses on the company's balance sheet. And then when you get to their implied enterprise value at the end of the analysis, and then you back into their implied equity value, simply count the net operating losses as a non-core business asset, just like equity investments, just like short-term or long-term investments, or a lot of other things on the balance sheet, and add them to this total at the end. So that's a simple way to do it. But of course, you probably came to this lesson looking for a tutorial on how to actually factor them in. So let's just go through that. And in doing so, you will understand some of the downsides of doing this and why we don't recommend doing it in most cases. This tutorial follows directly from our previous accounting tutorial on net operating losses, and we're going to take a lot of the formulas straight from there. The idea with net operating losses is that if a company has negative taxable income, and here, since we are building an unlevered DCF analysis, the taxable income is really just the operating income. So if a company has negative taxable income, we add that negative amount to the NOL balance, and we make sure it pays no cash taxes. It doesn't make sense for a company with negative 100 in operating income to end up paying negative 40 in taxes. That means they get 40 from the government. That's not what happens in real life. In real life, they simply don't pay taxes and they get a credit that they can use to offset future taxes. So with this setup, for the beginning NOL balance, we can go up and take the off balance sheet number. You always wanna start with this one because this represents the actual amount of losses the company has accumulated. The on balance sheet figure, which is what goes into the enterprise value calculation, represents the tax savings from these NOLs. So we link to the off balance sheet figure right there. And then for the NOLs that get created, we're gonna take the max between zero and the negative of the company's operating income. So what this says is that if the operating income is positive, putting a negative sign in front of it will make it negative, And therefore, we're just gonna use zero here. If the operating income is negative, putting a negative sign in front will make it positive. And if you wanna see this in action, you can change this percentage to negative 2%. When we do that, we now get NOLs created because of this negative taxable income. So we have that. And then the next step is that if a company has positive taxable income, we wanna apply as much of the NOL balance as we can to reduce its cash taxes. We're going to start by using a negative sign because this represents NOLs used. And we are gonna take our NOLs at this point, so the beginning balance plus the NOLs created, and then compare that to the maximum between the operating income and zero. So all this formula is really saying is that, first off, this only applies if the company has positive taxable income. That's what the max J490 says. If this is negative, it makes no sense to apply NOL, so this whole thing is just gonna be zero. So we essentially take the company's positive operating income, and then we compare it to the remaining NOLs at this point, and then we take whichever of those is lesser. So in this case, you can already see the result. We're gonna apply that whole balance because this balance is less than the company's operating income. 
We take that, add it up, and get to our ending NOL balance. And then we can get to a couple other figures related to this. For example, the NOL adjusted operating income. We can take our operating income right here, and then we can add our NOLs used. And then for the tax savings, we can take our NOLs used and multiply by the tax rate. Book taxes payable are fine as is, so I'm gonna keep that formula right there. And then for the cash taxes payable, remember this is what the company actually pays in cash taxes after it has offset its taxable income with those NOLs. So for this one, we use a negative sign because we wanna show negatives for the taxes here, and it's gonna be the max between our NOL adjusted operating income and zero. So that if this is negative, we pay no taxes. We're only gonna be paying cash taxes here if this is positive, and this is what the max J58 zero function does. And then we multiply by the company's tax rate right here. We have all that. Let's just copy across some of these formulas now. And you can see that after the first year in which those NOLs are used up, the book and cash taxes are the same in all years after that. And then the one final step here is to link to the cash taxes if we're factoring in the NOLs within free cash flow, but link to the book taxes if we're only counting the NOLs at the end in that implied enterprise value to implied equity value calculation. So to do that, we can just modify our formula for net operating profit after taxes here. And we can say that if we are counting the NOLs within free cash flow. We're going to link to the cash taxes payable. Otherwise, we'll link to the book taxes payable right there. And we have this. So if you think about the impact of these different methods, they are going to produce pretty similar results when the NOL balance is quite low. So here, for example, let's say we change this and we decide to count the NOLs within free cash flow. Right now, for reference, when we just add them in our implied equity value calculation at the end, we get implied share prices of 1890 and 1851, depending on the method we use. If we decide to count them within free cash flow instead, and this item goes away, then we get implied share prices of 1887 and 1849. And then within our free cash flow, of course, net operating profit actually goes up for the first year because our cash taxes payable are lower. So for a low balance like this, the results are very similar, especially because the NOLs get used up pretty quickly. You'll see bigger differences with larger NOL balances that get applied over many years instead of all in the beginning. For example, if we had, say, $5 billion in NOLs instead, and we chose to count the NOLs within free cash flow, we get an implied share price of $2401. On the other hand, if we change it, then we get an implied share price of $2691 if we count the NOLs in this calculation to get to our implied equity value right here. And in general, the implied value per share is gonna be lower if you include NOLs in free cash flow because of the time value of money. The tax savings from those NOLs are worth more today. So if you do what we're doing here and you count the NOLs in this implied equity value calculation, you are gonna to get to a higher share price. If you count them in free cash flow instead, the problem is that although you do realize value over time as these are used up, this is spread out over many years. And so the time value of money makes the application of these NOLs over many years less valuable than if you simply added the whole balance today. So after going through all this, you might be wondering why it's not a great idea to set up this type of schedule. After all, it only took a few minutes of work and it doesn't seem that complicated to factor in all of this. The first problem is that the NOLs might not be fully utilized by the end of the forecast period. Now here, when we have 5 billion in NOLs, surprisingly, they are actually utilized, so we don't have any issues. But if we had something like 10 billion in NOLs, take a look at what would happen here. So we'd be applying all these each year, and then at the end of the period, we'd still end up with about 2 billion of NOLs left over. So we run into a problem there, because now we haven't fully factored it in, even though we have included their value in the free cash flow. So we have to check how much remains, and if there's something left, we have to include it in the terminal value calculation. And you can see an example of that up here, that we simply add the value of the remaining NOL balance by taking that number, the ending balance over here, and multiplying by the tax rate and adding that to our terminal value. Now, that doesn't create a huge amount of extra work, but 
The point is that we could skip all of this and we could simply add the NOLs at the end when you go to the implied equity value of the company. The second problem is that it does take more work to set up the analysis this way, and perhaps more importantly, your model is going to be more difficult for other people to understand. A discounted cash flow analysis tends to have very standard items. So revenue, operating income, NOPAT, non-cash adjustments, working capital, capital expenditures. If you go in and add some type of separate schedule like this here, it is non-standard, and it's going to take someone else looking at this a bit of time to figure out what you're doing and why you set up the model like this. So from an understandability perspective, we think it's a whole lot better to set it up the way we did in the beginning. The other problem is that the whole value of this analysis is a bit questionable because the balance sheet value of NOLs represents the future tax savings anyway. So it's not as if you're gaining insight or looking at a different way to calculate the numbers here. When you see an item for NOLs of 4 billion, and then you know the off balance sheet number is 10 billion, regardless of how you count it, you're gonna apply this 4 billion in some way. The only question is whether you do it in the beginning in this calculation, or you spread it out over time by creating a separate schedule. So in short, the best way to factor in NOLs is to add them when you move from implied enterprise value to implied equity value at the end. You count NOLs as a non-core business asset and you add them just like you add cash and investments. The only reason not to do it is if the company has low or negative taxable income consistently in the future, which is pretty rare for healthy companies, but might happen. NOLs are going to make a bigger contribution there, so you should probably project the tax savings if the company has positive taxable income, and then also count the existing and newly created NOLs in the free cash flow. So for example, if the company had negative 5% operating margins for five years in the beginning, we'd end up with a much bigger balance at the end. And when you see numbers like this, where the NOLs are completely offsetting taxable income, and where even by the end, even with positive taxable income, there's still a huge balance, then in this type of scenario, which is pretty rare for healthy companies, you would want to factor in the NOLs. And then when you calculate terminal value and you do this, you have to remember to include the total value of the remaining NOLs times the tax rate when you get to the company's terminal value. And that's going to end up increasing the terminal value, the present value of terminal value, and the company's implied enterprise value. We're at the end, so let's do a recap and summary now. In the beginning, I told you about the inclusion exclusion rule in a DCF, where if you include the income or expense line item in free cash flow, you want to exclude the corresponding asset or liability. But if you exclude an item, then you want to include the corresponding asset or liability. This applies to net interest expense, it applies to NOLs, it applies to rent, it applies to almost anything you can think of. Then in part two, I showed you how to build a schedule for NOLs and how to set up all the formulas, how to calculate the book and cash taxes, and then when you calculate NOPAT, how to link to the proper taxes depending on which method you're using to factor in the NOLs. And then finally, in part three, we went over the problems with building a separate schedule, such as the fact that there might be a remaining balance at the very end, the fact that it takes more time and effort and makes your model harder to understand, and said that really the only case where you should actually factor in NOLs in free cash flow is if you're working with a company that has very low or negative taxable income and where there's a significant possibility that there are going to be NOLs remaining at the end of the period or that the company's going to create new NOLs over time as a result of its negative taxable income. So that's it for this tutorial. Hopefully you know a bit more now about net operating losses and how to include their value in a discounted cash flow analysis.